Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Matt Kenna. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show, CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I spoke with independent trader and president of the PAX Group, Matt Kenna. I kicked off today's chat by asking PAX to share with us his favorite story from the pit. Then he tells us how he made the transition from pit trader to screen trader, shares with us his morning preparation, trading process, and strategy. Last but not least, we discussed how PAX sizes his positions and breaks bad trading habits. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Pax. Pax, what's going on? What's up, Anthony? How are you, my friend? Good. Great to have you here today. And, I, and you and I go, we go way back. We go back to our days on the floor. And I know that many people probably want to hear us talk about the good old days when we were in the pits. But, you know, I really don't want to go there today because we both fully transitioned away from that type of trading. These are the good old days. Right? Exactly. But that being said, to kick things off, because you're such a great storyteller, <laughs> give us one of your favorite stories from the pit. Oh, I, my, it's not my favorite story, but it's a good story. I suppose January 5th, 2001, I believe it was January 5th, 2001, was um, the very first trading day of the year. And I remember because it was my, my, my oldest daughter's <laughs> Uh, kinder, first day of kindergarten or, or something, something to do with school. And I went in late. I never went in late. Anyway, um, there was rumors that, that Greenspan was going to cut interest rates and it was going to be a surprise cut because it was after the bubble had burst. And so I came in and, and I went over, I came in a little bit late, like I said, so not really prepared and not really, I didn't go through my routine. Even then I had some sort of a routine, not, not the kind of routine now. Anyway, market, um, Market was trading. The Nasdaq was trading around 1980 to to uh, 2000, and so I came in and and I I sold 10. I sold another till. I was down ticking, and uh, Judd, who's my my mentor, came over and said, "What are you doing? Don't be short here. The market's quiet." I said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna down tick him down to 68, and touch off some stops and get out. I'll make 10, 15 thousand. Well, I ended up getting short 18 big Nasdaq, and um, uh, all of a sudden, all oh, pandemonium broke loose. I had no idea what was going on. I'm, I'm screaming and yelling. I was the only big NASDAQ trader in the pit at the time. Susquehanna was in there. I'm asking for an offer. They've got no offer. When Susquehanna in those days didn't have a two-sided market, you knew where you were in trouble. The long and short of it is, is that I was short 18 big NASDAQ in the biggest rally in the history of the NASDAQ. <laughs> to this day, it stands 650 full points. The high of the day was 26 half. The low of the day was where I was short from. So I covered them at, instead of averaging that trade, and I, I had uh, brokers trying to buy 100 lots for me at 26 half, and one, one trying to sell me 100 at 24. That's, that's a 250 point swing. But in, I knew that I had to get out. There was, I, I wasn't going to put myself, my family, and my clearing firm at risk. I, I knew that I had one choice and one choice only, and that is to find an offer and get out. And so I did. I didn't, um, I did not sell those 26 halves. I did not buy those 24 evens. 
I paid 26 even on 18, and I lost 600 full NASDAQ points on an 18 lot. That was, that's my favorite story. That Actually, that is my favorite story. I like, I like telling that story, and I like talking about that story because there's so much meaning in it, uh, not just from a trader standpoint, but from a personal standpoint. That's the day that I learned that I was a real trader. That's the day. The next day is the day that I learned that the markets would not beat me, that they can bring me to my knees, but I, but I would not allow the markets to beat me. And that I also had to learn real trading skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get into the transition from pit to screen today, I want you to just really define that lesson a little bit more for all the traders out there listening. Well, one one very important aspect of it is is to not average not not, not to average a, a losing trade. Uh, I I didn't know where the market was going. It was the, all of this happened in a span of maybe thirty seconds, but it seemed like thirty minutes. I didn't know if the market was going to continue up to uh, another couple hundred points, if it was going to fall apart. So uh, I I had I had always been taught to to not average my trades and to get out when I when I'm wrong and obviously 600 points later I knew I was wrong and so I just looked for for a spot to get out period um, there there's there's uh, an old adage that uh, get out get out when you can not when you have to that time I had to and when you have to get out price price is irrelevant you just have to find an area to get out and so I did that's 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 one important aspect is to not average trades get out because you, there's always going to be a next one my job as a trader, and I talk about this a lot, my job as a trader is to be here tomorrow. Uh, not to try to make my day right now or not to try to dig myself out of a hole, but to be here tomorrow because tomorrow might be that big day for the month or that big day for the year. And so I want to be here for tomorrow's trade. By getting out at the level I got out, it hurt. It cost me a lot of money, but I ensured that I was there the next day to take advantage of what the market had in store for us the rest of the year. And I ended up having a very good year that year. Started off down a great deal of money, but that's part of it. You know, I talk about that an awful lot. We have to embrace the grind, as you say all the time, Anthony. I learned that, that, that phrase from you. But we have to embrace the grind. And as we embrace the grind, I've discovered along the way that it's – the most important part or the job of a trader, the job of a trader is to be here tomorrow, not to have to wire in more money into my account, not to, not to have to borrow more money to keep going. We've all been there. We've all done yeah. that. My job as a trader is to make sure that I am here to be able to take advantage of the trade tomorrow. And that means to get out of, get out of losers when I'm wrong and, and to, to learn how to ride my winners. Let's talk about the transition the the second phase of your career we'll call it right um, yes from pit to screen how long did it take how did you go about it walk us through that it I started trading on the screen really back in 2004 um, 2003 2004 2003 is when I first made my first screen based trade and uh, I had no idea what I was doing I I promptly lost six figures within a month's period of time and went back on the floor, but uh, you know, we had that ability to do that. So as time went on, I, I was trading in the hog pit and uh, I'd go back upstairs and I'd trade in my office and, and, and I was trying to gradually make that, that leap, but, um, or that transition. I, I didn't want it to be a leap. I wanted it to be more of a smooth transition. Well, as of anything, you know, or as in anything in my life, I, things don't really usually go very smoothly. I had to, I had to make that leap. So after, after a, a few business failures, uh, um, tied into not, 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 uh, tied into the, to, to the futures industry, but not necessarily to do with my trading. Uh, so after a few business failures and, uh, after, a uh, uh, clearing for, uh, clearing from failure, I had to start over again, and uh, uh, I had to be extra careful at this point. So in 2011, 2012, I had uh, I had a, a, the the extreme privilege to to have traded a, a brief time under the the uh, tutelage of uh, Peter Stottlemyre, and uh, Stottlemyre was was working on a new add-on to market uh, profile, 
and he was he wanted a couple traders to do it. And and this was all during the the MF global disaster time. So I had the time and 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 the inclination, and that's when I realized, you know what, I'm going to go back to trading, but I'm going to do it the right way this time. And I did. I went back, and I I, I started trading on my own in my own account. But I instead of putting a hundred thousand dollars in there, or fifty thousand dollars in there, because I knew if I had a hundred thousand, I'd make hundred thousand dollar mistakes. I knew if I had fifty thousand, I'd be making fifty thousand dollar mistakes, because that's the kind of trader that I am. I had to go back to the basics of what I was taught in 1998, and I mean the basics, which was the opening range trade. I'm long above the opening range. I'm short below the opening range, and then I also had to learn how to properly manage my trade so I minimized risk and I maximized my potential. And I started doing that, Anthony, in 2013, and I gradually rebuilt my life and my career. Talk to us about what you go through in your morning preparation. We, we discussed this a little bit on the Trading Future Show, and, and what really stood out for me when I asked you what you do in the morning, it was less about looking at charts. It was less about reading news. It was more about doing a morning meditation. That's, that's what it sounded like to me. So talk to us about what you do in the mornings. I, I, I need to keep things simple in my life. And I, I, I need to, in the morning, I, I, I need to start my, my brain almost like a computer. You know, how do I reboot in the morning? So the first thing that I do is, you know, I open up my eyes and I realize I've got breath in my lungs and, and, and I've got another day given to me. And I thank God for that. I get up and I very literally the first thing I do is I stretch. I do I do some stretching exercises, and then uh, then a, a guided meditation uh, that takes me through some breathing and it centers me. Uh, I get up really early so that I have the extra time in the morning to to just to center myself, to be at peace, and to to, to know that today is a new day and and a day that's going to give me new opportunity to be a better version of myself and a better trader and a better father, a better husband, a better son, a better brother, a better friend, not necessarily in that order. Uh, and so I do my breathing exercises and then I go and I do the same thing that everybody else does. I, I drink my coffee. I take a shower. After I take my shower, I sit down at my desk and I go over my plan that I'd worked on, my trading plan for the day that I'd worked on. Uh, after the close of the previous day, you know, I, I, I prepare, I prepare for the following day. I go over my charts. I go over the fundamentals. I read everything I can get my hands on. And then, then I draw out my plan. And so I go over my plan after I take my shower, uh, while I'm drinking my coffee and I'm ready for the day. If something is out of whack, I take my, actually an important part too, cause this is the last, today was the last day is I walk my daughter, my youngest daughter to the bus stop. That's something that her and I do. And it's something also important to my day. If any one of those things are missing then, or is, is, is shortened or interrupted in some way, shape or form, or I don't do them or I wake up late or I didn't sleep all that night before I'm, I'm mindful of it. I'm aware of that. And I know that uh, I know that uh, going into trading, going into the open of the market, that I have to be aware that something might be off. A good trader, Anthony, a good trader knows when to, to, to increase their size. A great trader knows when to decrease their size. And it took me a long time. And, and, and it took me a long time and a lot of work to learn how to decrease my size at the right time. Anybody can get in the market. Anybody can slap more on. But it really does take a very good trader to to know when to to peel it back and to slow things down. And if so, in in my morning in my morning prep, if I don't have the proper time to go over my plan, if I don't if I didn't go through my breathing exercises, if if I didn't go through my stretching, and I don't feel rested, I know that when the market opens, whether it's the gold or the crude or the equity markets, I know that I need to take things easy and and maybe not be so aggressive that day. This is why I say to people when they ask me what my trading rules are, I always say I have trading instincts because mm. what you just mentioned to me was my instinct to know when to stop. <laughs> you know, it, it, sure. when I when I look at my career and the days that I've lost the most money, 
<laughs> are the days that I knew I wasn't feeling well or something was in the back of my mind. It had nothing to do with the way the market was trading. It had everything to do with me and where I was in my head. Huh. And it's when I would unravel. And going back to the opposite side of that, another instinct is exactly what you said, knowing when to be aggressive. And that just comes with time. You know, I mean, you and I both know that at the beginning of our careers, for many years, I didn't know when to be aggressive. I thought I did, but I didn't. And <laughs> the best days of my career were not because the markets were the busiest. They were not because the markets were just walking in and handing out money. It was because I was right in my head and I was just in that zone, right? And mm. where you just felt it and you were just able to trade bigger when you knew you should, trade smaller when you knew, <laughs> when you, knew you should, take this trade. I shouldn't be taking that trade. That is so much about it. And then that's, that's one of the things I love about you uh, and what you've been, and I'm so glad you came to Twitter, by the way, and you're just, you're, you're an open book and you talk about these things and, and too many people make it seem like it's, it's not just X's and O's. It's not just black mm. and white. You know, it just, trading is more than that. Especially now. Yes. Especially now that we're on the screen. When, when, when I was on the floor, when we were on the floor, uh, it, you know, you can be slovenly, you, you, you can live you can live a non-disciplined life and come on the floor at, you know, the market opened at 8.30. You can come onto the floor at 8.20, jump into your spot at 8.29 and make a great living. You can't do that now. Impossible. I remember I remember the first time I was, I started like anybody else on the floor, trading one lots and two lots and then three lots and five lots. I remember when uh, a broker, a bro we were really, really busy in the NASDAQ and then we were trading 30 or 40, 50 points on one side of the pit away from the other. And uh, um, uh, Jayhawk, a broker, <laughs> jammed jammed a fifty lot. Tried to jam a fifty lot down my throat. He's like, "Sell you fifty? Uh, uh, no, no, uh, I'll buy five. Pax, I sold you fifty. It's trading fifty points higher over there. I'll buy thirty back from you. That was the first time that I traded size. Now, that's not how I'm going to trade size nowadays. Yeah. Now it's about discipline, and now it's about my life being being in order. Now it's about the ham, and, and now it's it's about my habits that I've worked on, that help me to to be disciplined and 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 when to turn it on and when to turn it off. And it's funny you mentioned Jayhawk. I was with Bobby, his brother, the other day, and when we were in London, <laughs> uh, good people. Now let, oh, let, let's talk. Two of my about, favorites. Yeah, let's talk about your process a little bit. Um, we talked about this in the Trading Future Show. How opening range is your primary strategy and we did a lot of examples where people can go if you guys want to go and check that out on youtube go ahead but what i want to talk about is why you chose it more and i and and i know a lot of people probably look at this and say it's so simple probably many would say it's too simple how, how are you going to make money <laughs> trading just based off of the opening range so talk to us about why you chose opening range and what you think about uh, people saying maybe it's it's just too simple. Um, I, I, it is too simple, and and or it's not too simple, but it is simple, and it needs to be simple for me. I'm not a genius. I need it to be simple. I, and uh, uh, I liked what you said earlier about instincts as opposed to rules. I don't have rules. I have guidelines, and and uh, those guidelines, the opening range guidelines, help me stay within my lane. Now it needs to be simple. Uh, and tra it, it is simple for me, and it needs to be simple because trading is simple. I, I don't need things to be to I I need to control my risk. I need to minimize my risk, and, and I need to maximize my profit. I I need to. I'm not a market maker on the floor anymore. I'm not gonna. I when when I was on the trading floor and I was taught how to trade the opening range by Judd Judd Hirschberg. Uh, I was taught the very same way that I do it now, only once I became a bigger trader, it was my job to, you know, when I was long above the opening range, I would have to also buy the 75s and the 80s and, you know, and then trade around it. Now, I don't do that. I let the, I let the algos do that. And I manage my position along the way. I use the first 30 seconds of, of, of the pit opening or of the day session. So if I'm trading gold, uh, I'm use it's 7:20, um, it's 7:20 Central Time. If I'm trading crude, it's 8 8 o'clock Central Time. If I'm trading equities, it's 8:30 Central Time. The first 30 seconds 
has traditionally been known as the opening range on the trading floor for, you know, I don't know, 100 years, 200 years. And this, this process of trading goes, goes back as far as we can tell from Judd and Ira Harris talking about it. It goes back into the 50s from the traders that they knew. Glenny Feldman and other, other uh, old timers that, that traded, you know, in very similar fashions. It's just, it's, it's, it's a momentum breakout trade. So if the opening range is, is uh, you know, for example, 70 to 73, I want to be long above 73. And then I've got my position management skills that I've that I have employed and and, and learned uh, through the years uh, that that help me decrease my risk. Um, but and it's the same thing on the downside. So it is very simple. Uh, Judd taught me it back in 1998. I when I first started trading, I I I was I, I didn't have I had a backer, the guy that I worked for, SRG, had backed me. Steve had backed me with the T bill, but. I had to come up with my own trading capital. I started out with $10,000 that I borrowed from my dad and um, I got down to 200, I had $257 left in my account. And I was going to make, I was going to make uh, an appointment with a couple of guys to, to back me and to take 50% of what I made for the next three years. I talked to, I, I ended up, I was I smoked then. And I went as, as did many of us on the trading floor. And I went to have a cigarette and I was talking to, to another NASDAQ trader and I told him what was going on and, and he said, no, don't do that. This is going to be the, this pit is small now. We only had 10, 15 guys in there. We would do with 2000 contracts a day if we were busy. This is going to explode. And when it does, we've only got three or four or five really good years left before it goes. This will be the last pit ever. So I walk onto the floor. I put that cigarette out, walk onto the floor and Steve Mendez is walking around with Judd looking for me and he introduces me says, listen, he's looking to, to train guys how to trade. And, you know, he told me a little, about, a little bit about him. And, and, and so we started working together. It took me about two weeks before I finally made my first opening range trade. You know, and Judd was getting frustrated with me. Um, but I finally decided, look, I've got $257 left in my account. Uh, the NASDAQ was $100 every tick for every one lot then. You know, so if I bought one at 74 and I sold it at 75, that was $100. So I knew that one trade, one bad trade could wipe me out. After talking to Judd in our morning meeting, I figured, you know what? I don't have anything to lose. My best trading, my best thinking, picking tops, picking bottoms, uh, trying to trade support and resistance levels and trying to trade pivot points without any real skills got me, you know, got me to the point that where I, where I was. And so I trusted him. And I bought one out of the opening range. At that point, the NASDAQ averaged about eight points out of the opening range every day. I, I remember I bought one at, um, um, at 12, and I sewed it up at 20, and I ended up making $800. And that was that day changed my life. I went from $257 in my account to over 1000 and I was off to the races. Anyway, when I started back again on the floor, I needed a nice, simple process. When I started, I mean, uh, on the screen, when I started trading on the screen, I started like gangbusters, of course, you know, I, uh, uh, but then I, I quickly paired it back and went right back to basics, long above, short below, period, period. And Anthony, it's worked. It's worked. It helped me to build, to start building up my account and to rebuild my business, to rebuild my career. And I stick with it. The days that I fear from it are the days that I find myself you know, in a little bit of trouble. I stick with it. What it sounds like to me is you just wanted a sense of direction and then let the trader and you come out and trade that direction. A hundred percent. Right. Right. You know, look, we're above opening range. Look, I believe in this. I, this guy has told me it works. I, I've seen it work. Now let me just trade this way. You know, exactly. it, it cuts through everything else. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about fundamentals because I know that you speak with Ira a lot. You read Ira's blog and he's very much got this fundamental backdrop to which I, I read and, and use in my trading a lot as well. But you and I are also similar to where, you know, we use, I use very basic technicals. I use support and resistance lines. And when you, when you would look at me, you wouldn't know that I have any sort of fundamental backdrop in my strategy, but it's, to me, it's more of awareness of situations. That's how I use it. Mm -hmm. uh, aware of uh, what's happening in the markets to keep me out of 
more or less bad trades than to put me in good ones. I guess that's the way I look at fundamentals for me. How do you use them if you use them? I, I do. I use I use fundamentals. Uh, I'm very. It, it's hard to explain. I, I I'm very careful in not bringing a bias into my trading. But I need to know what's going on all around the world because when I when I have matchups either technically or I have matchups uh, fundamentally with what's going on in the world and going on in the markets, then I know that this is something that I can I can really jump into. So I might I might I trade in unit size and not in contract size. So you know I might put on an extra unit or an extra unit and a half. Uh, the, the 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 so fundamentals come into play like that for me. The other day I was talking to Ira about this actually. He came into our room we were talking and uh that day I was long gold, short crude and I was uh um long gold, short crude and short this was like a week ago and I was short the S&P and um and, oh, and long tenure. And so he just thought that I was that boy oh boy was I the best macro trade in the world. <laughs> so Ira I'm not I did all of those trades based on the opening range. I bought the gold, I bought the ten-year, I sold, uh, I sold crude, and I sold the S and P all in the opening range. And I, I, I peeled off. In, in I've got a, a system to where I, I remove risk from trades so that I've got my trades are now free. There's no risk to my be, my beginning balances. For example, in the S and P, I use a four-point rule. So for the four-point breakout out of the opening range. I remove the first third of the first quarter, depending on what unit size I'm using. Uh, uh, I sell, you know, say that again. The example of 70, 73. If I if I sell 70s, I'm buying uh, I'm buying my first third back at 66, and now I've got four points locked in, and I can let the other two thirds go down to my target levels. Anyway. Um, so while I'm talking to Ira and we're talking about everything going on with interest rates and and the you know the 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 steepening of the yield curve, <laughs> here I am that day you know just happened to be short. I mean long uh, long the ten year while the yield curve is 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 continuing the steepening of the, and, and short the short the equity markets and we were talking about gold going up to to thirteen I think it was thirteen fifty and it did it ended up going up there and then kind kind of coming off but. So I'm aware of the technicals. I'm aware of the fundamentals, and it 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 helps me manage my positions once I get them on. I don't put my positions on as a result of that. I guess that was a story. That was the point of of me uh, uh, telling you about, about that day that I ever thought I was. Boy, you're really you're really listening, Matt. You really have the 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 macro story on. No, it was all the opening range. But then that ha uh, the fundamentals will help me manage the trade. I, after I remove risk by taking the first third off of any any of those any market that I happen to be trading in, then I'm able to sit with the trades longer. Especially if I know that that the ten year has got a particular spot that it needs to go to, uh, based on whatever's going on, or or uh, uh, you know crude is is has got a particular spot that it wants to trade under. Yeah, well, it's very similar to me, and I mean fundamentals will keep you in in trades if you're going with the fundamentals and you, you yes. have a you know you have a technical trade that you got into and then we'll, you're using your opening range and and then you know ira says well look at this is the fundamental picture that's happening today well maybe you know instead of working your way out of that one too soon maybe you try to leave some more trailers on and let them go a little bit further because you have multiple things going your way and originally i had said that it keeps me out of a lot of bad trades or trades i feel like i shouldn't take because if there is something going on with the Fed or, or whatever the case may be, and I am looking at something technical that there's a big move happening and it's about to fade that move, well, maybe I don't fade it that day because the fundamentals are going uh, in that direction and I'm looking to step in and look for that move to, to, to revert and maybe it just doesn't today because there's a fundamental thing going on. So yeah, it definitely, yeah it's definitely important, I think, f these days so much more to have that just awareness. It's a great point, Anthony. It, 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 I have to have that awareness, both fundamentally and technically, but also uh, I have to let the price action dictate my trades. So I, I always initiate my trades based off of the, 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 the opening range. I always, I always do. 95% uh, I, I, of the time I will. Uh, but 
the technicals and the fundamentals will help me stay in the trade longer. Now, if I if I'm short the S and P, or if I'm long the S and P, and I built a a position on, and we're coming into a Fed decision, if if I'm if we're above the opening range, I'm going to be long. I've got my stops in, so I'm protected, you know. And then I've got I'll have my orders in to take me out at my targets. But you know, I, I don't always stay out. What I'm but what I mean by that is I also don't always stay out. If I've got something that I've, if I've got a position on, a, whether a swing position or something that I've built over the course of the last week or two, um, that I'm going to, I'm going to hold that position going into that, into, into those numbers, you know, into those decisions anyway. You've already briefly talked about how you take a portion of your positions off for X amount of points if they happen. And we've talked about this also uh, on the trading futures program, where I think that we actually had detailed examples of of how you go about doing uh -huh. that. But what I want to talk about is how are you determining contract size? Uh, you know, how are you eventually getting bigger? How are you sometimes trading smaller if all of that is based off of the opening range? You know, how, how are you going about determining that size of your position and potentially, if you ever do, I don't know, add or like even press a position? Oh, sure. So uh, I use, I'll use Judd's, um, Judd's matrix works, Judd, uh, Judd, my mentor. I still, by the way, I still have my same mentor from 1998. Judd is still my mentor today. Uh, so I'll use his, I'll, I'll use his, his, uh, his work. And then there's another technician whose work I trust. So when, for example, if if we're opening at a major, uh, at a, you know, if we're opening at the 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 200 week in crude, and I'm already short crude, I know that underneath it, now I can go ahead and, and increase my size because I know I know where I'm wrong, and as long as I know where the market's telling me I'm wrong, I feel comfortable in increasing my unit size. If the market is, if 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 it's just a regular opening range trade, and and we're not near any major moving averages or any major levels, technically or fundamentally, then I'm going to use my 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 normal unit size, which is nice and comfortable for me. You know, and I trade in multiples of three. You know, so a unit could be a nine lot in the S and P. You know, or it could be a three lot in the S and P, depending on the day, uh, and or it could be more. Uh, but if we if we're opening, if it's just a normal day and I'm using a normal unit size, uh, I'm going to still use the same position management that I do every day. It doesn't matter whether I have a three lot on or you know a three hundred lot on, which I never have three hundred lots on, by the way. That was on the trading floor. But the point is, I manage the positions the same way. In the in, in the Nasdaq over over the years, I found that four points. Is is I mean in the S and P I found that over the years four points is 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 where the market needs to get through in order to expand the range. So again, if the opening if the opening range is at seventy to seventy three area and we get up out of it on the upside, and we've got the the two hundred day at seventy five or seventy seven and that's around the four points. As soon as we get above that, now I've got a free trade on. We're pushing above it and I can add at that point. Or if we've got uh, you know uh, uh, an important level in Judd's matrix work that we're coming up to, I know that I can go ahead and, and add at that level. Uh, usually, I'll I'll actually uh, let me back up. I will exit uh, a, a running position that I've carried into at that level, and then once we get above it, I will add back what I what I exited. I always leave something on. I'll always leave a runner on in the market, unless of course I get scratched out. But if the market doesn't scratch me out, I'll leave that runner on again, even if it's just one mini. It usually is more, but even if it's just one, I'll leave that I'll leave that runner on until the market decides that that trend is over. The way that I trade, Anthony, it, it may seem very simple. The opening range trade, along with my targets, are meant to exploit the 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 daily range, fully exploit the daily range. So I, I, I buy or sell out of the opening range and my targets are gonna be four points to remove risk. And then the next third is going to be at the next target. And then the next third will be at the, the second target with something left to run. And same thing on the downside. Uh, now my runners are meant to exploit the, the, the entire trend. I need to improve on that, I need to get better. 
when it's easier for me as I guess as an old pit trader to to trade the trend on the downside that it is on the upside. I'm a much better short as most traders are, or at least, you know, guys of our generation. Um, I can hold shorts. I can hold uh, uh, a short position a little bit better or longer than I can a, uh, a long position. But anyway, the market also seems to do, seems to rally uh, a lot more overnight than it does during the day. So if I get stopped out of longs, then I don't have such a big position. But anyway, I, I, I'll exit at Judd's matrix levels i'll exit it at big other uh fundamental targets or or um uh, uh technical targets more more uh more to the point but i always try to leave something on so that i can exploit the full day's range and so that i can exploit the 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 larger trend yeah no it makes sense to me i mean you're using bigger picture technicals that you're getting from judd or uh, some sort of technical strategy that you're looking at and when that comes into play, whether you're in a trade or getting out of a trade, you react to how the market's reacting to those areas. Exactly. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And it's that simple. I, I am not, I, I, I am smart enough to know that I am not smart enough to know. <laughs> I, yep, did I, it's... did I just coin a phrase? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, Pax, what is it about everything that you talked about that you believe gives you an edge? The fact that I'm smart enough to know that I'm smart enough not to know. Now, uh, 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 truly, I think, Anthony, I, uh, what gives me my edge is is that I've learned to allow the algos to do – I don't fight the algos anymore. I let the algos and the bots do the work for me. I've learned how to do that by by managing my positions by, by – again, and it, this may sound – silly to some but i always always in the in the s p i use four points in in the nasdaq when i'm trading nasdaq i use 10 to 12 points out of the opening range i haven't traded russell in a while but um i use 12 ticks and crude is 20 cents and gold is two dollars so i peel off the first third and i and that way i remove risk now i have a free trade on now when i get when we get to the second target and I remove the second third or the, the second quarter, again, depending on if I'm trading in, in units of three or units of four, then I, I can, I, I put in a stop, I'll go run, I'll go work out, I'll, you know, I'll, I'm done. You, you know, I'm literally finished trading and I'll, I'll leave. And I, if the market is, continues higher, it continues higher. If I get stopped out, I get stopped out, but it's always for a profit. Let's talk about breaking bad habits and building new good habits because let's face it. Oh God. <laughs> as, as traders, we always start off building bad habits. I, I don't know a trader out there that hasn't started a trade and has started building bad habits. And then it becomes extremely difficult, especially if you had some success with a bad habit oh. to then break it and build a new good habit. Oh, I work with I work with traders so many so often now and uh, about about this exact thing. But building building breaking bad habits to me means so many things. From from uh, uh, stops I I, had, I I smoked for my whole I, I didn't start smoking until I got on the trading floor. Like that day, <laughs> the day that I got on the trading floor, I was like, oh my god, this is for me. Give me a cigarette, and I smoked. <laughs> my brains out until until just uh, until six years ago seven years ago my son said six years ago so it was six years ago i can't remember when i quit smoking frankly anyway um so simple as that and also eating right and, and exercising but one of the things that we talk a lot about is is picking tops and picking bottoms and everybody's got their their particular way of doing it you know and and, and i've seen I've seen traders make a lot of money doing it and be very, very successful long term. But it takes a really uh, it takes an incredible amount of discipline in order to do that. And I don't have that kind of discipline. When I came back uh, and I, I needed to make money back in 2013, I needed to make I needed to be positive, you know. And so I I, I, I would trade the opening range and I'd make a th couple of thousand dollars and and uh, I'd be all happy. And then, hey, oh, well, you know, this, these 82s, this looks like the top. I'm going to sell them. And now I'm buying 84s. Oh, the market's rallying, so I'm going to get long. Now I'm selling them back at 80. So, you know, I, I'm trading in the middle. 
all of those things, pick and tops, pick and bottoms, trading in the middle, that creates, uh, a, when I started tweeting back in August of this year, uh, a new term I learned, which is FOMO. FOMO. I didn't know. I, I know what FOMO is. I've lived it. I've starred in that movie. I've directed and written it. But I didn't know there was an actual term for it. FOMO. Fear of missing out. You know, the, or, or just just the your your the market's moving and you've got to be a part of every move you got to be a part of every wiggle you know it's it's okay and it's really hard for traders to learn this it's okay to miss a trade it's okay to not be involved in the market if you are unsure of the market if you don't feel comfortable in it if you don't see it clearly it's okay to not be involved because you know you're 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 not going to be thinking about lost money. You're not going to be thinking about what you did yesterday or what you did before. The only trade that matters, only trade that matters to me ever, is the next trade that I'm going to make. And that's why it's so important. It's my job as a trader to be here tomorrow, because that might be the day that my wildest financial dreams come true. So it. Breaking bad habits is just simply a matter of of knowing who we are. If we don't know, if we don't know who we are as a trader, we are in big trouble. My 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 daily routines help me to 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 develop good habits, just on a day to day basis. Eating right, sleeping right, taking care of myself emotionally, physically, and spiritually, and and then I can. Then I can, you know, not not I, I can, but it enables me to take the emotion out of trade. So I don't keep my PL on my screen. My PLs aren't I, I don't have PLs up on my screens at all. I don't know what my 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 money is. I, I you know, I, I can't look up at the S P and see, oh look, I'm long and, and oh, I'm up one thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred. You know, I if I when I did that, I would exit trades too quickly or I would hold on to losers too much. I've never been much of an average you know, a trader that averaged losers, but I would hold on to, I would get out too early and I would uh, hold on to losers too long if I'm staring at the, the, um, the P and L. So I've taken that off and, uh, and that's helped me, helped me along with habits that I've built to fall back on, on trusting myself. If we don't, if we really don't know who we are as, as traders, then we're going to have a tough time being long-term profitable. It's that is the most important. That 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 to me is that the hardest part about trading is is us. The hardest part about trading is me and what I bring into it. I I I I have a very simple strategy. I have a very simple process that I employ every day, and that simple process that I employ every day it exploits. The, the the entire day's range often. Uh, I leave something on the table, but uh, I exploit the range and I exploit the trend oftentimes. I, I, I miss it. And when I miss it, that's okay because I know that there'll be another one. I've learned how to trust myself because I've got guidelines. I've got habits that I've been able to fall back on. Great stuff. And, and I've said this many times on the show and I'm going to say it again. Being a trader is a journey of oneself. <laughs> oh. It, 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 it just is. Next up is some rapid fire questions, Pax, if you're ready for those. No, of course. <laughs> Need a sip of water or a break or something before we get in? <laughs> <laughs> Let me go have a cigarette first. I'll be right back. <laughs> All right, everybody. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit tradingtechnologies.com. Pax, first question for you. What trader has influenced your life the most and why? Judd Hirschberg. Uh, Judd had, Judd is, Judd taught me, you know what, Mickey, Judd Hirschberg and Mickey Hoffman. So I'm going to amend my answer. Judd Hirschberg, because he taught me how to trade and he still keeps me and holds me accountable 20, almost 22 years later. Mickey Hoffman, because he was my coach on the trading floor and he taught me the mindset of a trader and how to battle every single day and how to every day try to be a better version of myself. 
What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? Success. I had a difficult time dealing with success. I was very young and uh, I was young and, uh, uh, and I, I, and, and my success exploded very quickly and I had a difficult time in, in understanding and getting a hold of that. So that, that was hard for me. How has your trading process evolved over the years? My goals are much different. Uh, I take things, I, I, I've learned how to take things a lot easier and slower. And I learned when the right time to, to push them and to speed them up are. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? Discipline. What a vague term that is, but discipline. Favorite book about trading? You know, re uh, I love that question. Reminiscence of a stock operator for sure. I've read it a couple of times and, uh, and I'm, I'm going to reread it on vacation, the, this next vacation that we're taking. I get something out of it each time I read it. And also uh, uh, Trading Sardines by Linda Rashke. I'm in, I'm in the middle of reading that book and and it's, it's, it, it, I recommend everybody get it. It's, it, I think that you and I could have written much of it. Um, you know, any, any experience for a trader can, but reminiscences of a stock operator, I get something out of it, every, something different out of it each time I've read it and trading sardines by Linda Rashke. Favorite movie about trading? Uh, trading places for sure. What's the best piece of advice that you've received about trading? <laughs> Emo told me on the train one day, don't worry about what the banks are doing or what the big traders are doing. When you want to be long, buy them. When you want to be short, sell them. When you're wrong, get out. When you're right, let them run. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would you say? Enjoy the ride a little bit more. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge, what would you tell me? I let the algos do the work by getting involved in the market at the same time they are, they do. And I employ uh, position management skills that help to eliminate or minimize my risk while letting me sit with things and maximize my profit. Last question for today, Pax. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not trading? Spending time with my children. This was great, buddy. Where can people find you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? You can find me at, you know what? I don't even know what my Twitter name is. No, no, you can find me at PaxTrader777 on Twitter. Uh, also, you can find me, I've got a, uh, a website. That's www.thepaxgroup.org. Pax, this was awesome. Thank you so much, my friend, for joining me on Futures Radio Show today. Anthony, thank you. As usual and as always, it's it's fun to talk to you. It's a privilege to be your friend, and it's a great privilege to be a part of what you are doing. Cheers, buddy. Cheers to you, brother. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.